Tony Davis there from Tiger. And while he may be upbeat about the future, the dark cloud which could very well rain on everyone in the sector is oil. For the first six months of this year, the cost of jet fuel spiralled from around $100 US a barrel to just under $175. Cost increases like that can only be absorbed for so long before being transferred to passengers. Since the beginning of 2008, jet fuel prices have soared 72%. We're preparing for an industry-changing event as airlines warn of higher prices and lower financial results. To cope for fuel, we do have to have our average fares increasing and the airlines have been adding fuel surcharges and increasing airfares when they can at peak times, at peak demand times, on peak days in order to achieve that. We think the, these $150 uh, prices for oil are really hard to explain and, and in our medium term plans we had them setting, setting back down at 110 that said, that's still higher than where it was a year ago. But airlines are warning the fare increases still aren't enough to cover their costs. The IATA represents over 240 carriers worldwide. In 2007, its members made a profit of 5.6 billion US dollars. This year, it's predicting a record loss of 6.1 billion. In Australia, our main carriers have seen a massive dip in their share prices. It's affecting personal fortunes too. Virgin Blue's CEO Brett Godfrey has seen his own personal wealth drop by over $50 million in 12 months. Aviation journalist Jeff Easdown says the reason is oil. I think it's simply because of the rising fuel prices. They'll come back and, and they'll come back when things turn around. But for now, the Qantas Group has seen a 120% jump in its fuel bill from 17% of overall costs in 2004 to 29% in 2006 and it's expecting fuel to reach 40% of its total costs for 2008. That's forced a big change in the way the company operates. One advantage that we have in the Qantas group is that we have both players in the game. We have a full service carrier with Qantas Airways and we have a low cost carrier. And we have the flexibility that most carriers around the world don't have. Uh, we can flex one or the other dependent on the market circumstances and how the market reacts. Qantas is pushing ahead with its $35 billion new generation fuel efficient aircraft plan. Jetstar is taking delivery uh, in 12 months time of the 787 Dreamliner. Now that's a, a lighter plane, it uses something like 20% less fuel. So what's causing the rise in the cost of aviation fuel? It's tied to the price of crude, which is being impacted by supply and speculation. So I think it's probably a little too simplistic to argue that it's strictly speculators or strictly fundamentals alone. But what we have seen is that there's been some key fundamental drivers that have contributed to higher oil prices. Most notably in recent times, it's been the decline in net oil exports. So countries that have been exporting oil for a long period of time have actually declined in 2006 and 2007. The obvious answer for the airlines is to increase fares and surcharges, and that's already happening. Virgin Blue recently announced an average increase of $5 a fare, while Qantas increased fares by 3% in May and a further 4% in June. Those significant increases, when at the same time we've taken costs out of our operation because of scale, uh, do mean uh, that we have to recover that somehow and that has to come through the fare, through fares. But higher fares can mean fewer passengers. Virgin Blue has already recorded a 4.2% drop in revenue load in April and a further 3.3% drop in May. Although the expectation is that people won't stop flying altogether just because prices go up. With had a great time. We've had discount fares at, at the lowest we've ever had them. People have got used to flying. The in introduction of Jetstar, uh, Virgin Blue and Tiger has created a whole new perception of travel. Um, people used to travel interstate on coaches. How many people are travelling interstate on coaches now? They, they won't go back to that. Despite all this, the airlines are still trying to expand cutting regional services across Australia and pushing ahead with overseas expansion. For Jetstar, it's Vietnam, while the Open Skies Agreement has opened the way for Virgins via Australia to fly to the United States. Coming up on State of the Airline Industry. Sydney Airport really had capacity issues. Uh, we know that that's the case. The Federal Transport Minister's outlook and... It's been tremendously successful. Carving a niche and proving the second airport theory really works in Australia.
Welcome back. You're watching a special presentation focusing on the state of the airline sector. It's been more than six years since the collapse of ANSET and what truly was a collapse of an Australian icon. At the time, fingers were pointed in every direction, management, the government, owner in New Zealand and the unions. The question now is whether the industry has learnt enough to make sure it doesn't happen again. They were different times before the Second World War when the Fokker Universal monoplane took off from Hamilton in Western Victoria to become Reg Ansett's answer to the Victorian government's road transport legislation. He decided well, he'd get around the problem by uh, buying an old plane and, uh, and running, the, running the people by air. And it was a three, in those days it was a three hour trip from Hamilton in Victoria to, up to Essendon Airport. The business was floated, the routes expanded and over six decades ANSET became ANSET Australia, taking on TAA and becoming one half of the country's airline duopoly. But a stake bought by Air New Zealand was the beginning of what would eventually be a very nasty end. The fleet was old, um, had to be replaced and the New Zealand government were asked to change the lending rules so that Air New Zealand could borrow offshore but nothing happened. So the, in the end, the New Zealand government had to bail out Air New Zealand after the, after the crash. So it was a lot of hurt that shouldn't have happened. Two days after the sector was struck by the September 11 attacks, Air New Zealand placed ANSET Australia into administration. I'm just devastated. Well, it was 16 years ago. Believe me, this was just the best thing in the whole wide world as it has been. And then it's it was the end of the road for thousands of well-paid airline employees. At this point in time, you know, it's been a fairly emotional 24 hours. I don't think it's really hit me. Um, probably in 12, 24 hours, 48 hours on the track when, uh, when I actually realised that I'm actually going to go flying again, it might be a little bit different. So what caused ANSET's collapse and what has the industry learned? Aviation journalist Jeff Easdown wrote the book on ANSET's collapse. Air New Zealand came in as a small operator sending people across the, ta uh, sending people across the Pacific to America and, and overseas on, on their jumbos and thinking they could uh, take on a major domestic airline in Australia and, and challenge Qantas. Well, Qantas have been around for a long time and by trying to undercut Qantas on, on uh, their business, business deals and business contracts, Qantas just undercut them as far as they could and brought in extra capacity and that was the end of things. Administrators Mark Menther and Mark Corder moved in to save employee entitlements. Up to 90 cents in the dollar was rescued. But 18,000 people were made unemployed, the largest mass job loss in Australian history. Six years later and the memories of ANSET's collapse still haunt the industry. You have to act fast on your feet, you have to be able to adapt and you have to, to be able to move forward. And I think it is survival of the fittest and, it's, and, and it is the evolution of carriers that if you don't um, manage your business and be willing to change and willing to make hard decisions, you may not survive. And I think we're all very conscious of that. And look at what ANSET did, uh, they were inactive for a large period of time, didn't do, make the right decisions. Uh, to make sure that the business was efficient, um, lean, mean and organised to cope with that type of environment. And I think that's the biggest thing that we would take out of that experience. <laughs>